do you do when somebody comes up to you and says, you know, I really don't believe you have dementia. You don't look like you have Alzheimer's. It happened to me the first time after I had given a public address and I was asking questions from, from the audience. Somebody stood up and raised their hand and they said, you know, I've been working in Alzheimer's for 12 years now and I watched you very closely. And I don't think you have Alzheimer's. see that in themselves. So when people say to me, I was walking down the hall here from, to, after 
after my last presentation. And a man stopped me and said, you know, I noticed you only looked at your notes twice. I said, yes. He said, but you spoke for 12 minutes. And I said to him, I could have spoken for an hour and a half if they'd given it to me. <laughs> I said, because when you're speaking from your heart, when you're speaking from your life's experience, when you're bearing your soul, you don't lose life's experiences. You don't lose your heart. You don't lose your soul when you have dementia. What you may lose is your ability to move your articulators. You may lose the ability to communicate in ways that other people communicate. But all of that is inside of you. You know you have dementia. Even if you are saying to the outside world, there's nothing wrong with me, it's all with you. You know there's something wrong here. So on one level, it's very offensive when people think that and say that. Because they miss the ultimate me. They've wasted time here figuring out, golly, you know, you're a black person, but you're smart. How can that be? And instead of understanding who I am, they focused on the color of my skin. Golly, you have this condition or that condition, but it's just amazing how you get along. It's not about how good I am on crutches or with a prosthetic leg or in speaking when I'm losing my voice. It's about who I am as a human being. And it may take a little while longer or I may communicate it differently than all of you would communicate it. But my God, some of us are down to giving you a business card that says, I have Alzheimer's. And for God's sakes, don't be your pushy self. I need some time to figure out my responses. That's what happens to us. We're down to giving out business cards to forewarn a waitress who's in a hurry or a service provider, that we need a little bit more time because we have dementia. Now that's a reflection, I think, on our busy society. Now hurry up, you're on Facebook, and if it takes 10 seconds for the, to load, then you're on Twitter. And if that takes 20 seconds to load, you're back to Facebook. And then maybe you'll check your Gmail. Because time, live time, has become shorter and faster to us. And for those of us with disabilities, live time has become longer and more painful and more difficult for us to deal with, especially early on with our live time when we're just figuring things out. And that's the very time when people want us to hurry up because they want to be assured that we're okay. And the way we assure that we're okay is to act okay. Well, how do you act okay? Well, you don't forget any words. You always, you don't have to find words. You always stay on task. You're always caught up with a conversation. Those are signs people look for to see if you have dementia. But in the earlier stages of dementia, most of those stop signs are still there. We're just, and I don't know if we're smart enough or dumb enough, to cover them up. We don't say, wait a minute, now wait a minute. I, I've lost track of where we are. We try to catch up on our own. We don't say, wait, I'm a little confused because we're talking about four or five different things here like we always do and I can't follow four or five things. We just pick one thing out. Fortunately for me, because I'm tall and have a PhD, people are willing to wait to see what the doctor said. But for people who are not tall and don't have PhDs, they just look at us quizzically like, well, aren't you with the program? Why can't you catch up? So for those of you in the audience who have dementia, I don't have an easy answer to how you respond to people who think you don't have dementia or actually say you don't have dementia. It doesn't do either one of us any good for me to be offended by that because that just shows their naivety. It's not a reflection on you. 
I at first thought it was a positive reflection on me because I knew what I was doing in my head and nobody seemed to know it. And even now, I've reached a point with my symptoms where I reach a point where I know when I'm not going to know a word at the end of a sentence. I have trouble not noun finding. And I figure that out about halfway through the sentence. And my language of thought is faster than I can speak. So I'm thinking, what the hell is it now? Where are you going with this? What's that guy's name? What are you going to say when you get to the end? How are you going to turn this around so that you can change the subject without anybody noticing you change the subject. Those are all internal conversations I have with myself in a split second. And it's because I have dementia. So should I get a medal because I'm good at covering it up? Or should I be defrocked as a fraud because I'm so insecure I don't want people to know that I have dementia? Well, the answer is probably somewhere in between. And that's the answer for everybody, I suspect, is somewhere in between. Should we wear a big badge that says, I have dementia, so nobody asks us? A friend of mine, who I'm going to introduce in a minute, uh, carried around his scores for his psychological tests as a proof of the validity of what the diagnosis was. My wife changed insurance six times the first six years I had dementia. So I was diagnosed six times with dementia because no two neurologists trust each other's diagnosis, so they all have to make their own diagnosis. And when I tell people that, the doubters think, see, they can't even come to a consensus. It takes six of them to decide if he's got dementia or not. This is a very difficult world to live in, living with dementia. We're very good at pretending it's not difficult, but that doesn't mean it isn't. And I think most of the uh, people in the audience know that. It's why you fear having dementia. It's why you see us as being empty shells that the dementia has eaten up or sucked out of our bodies or drawn away. You know that's what's happening to us. But you say to us, you don't look that way. Or you say to us, well, it hasn't happened to you yet. You're still my husband. I'm always going to be your husband. I'm always going to have dementia. I'm always going to be Richard. Now I'd like to introduce a friend of mine, Sid. Sid is from the United States. And he has a different... We still got time. <laughs> <laughs> um, he has a different slant on this about what it is like when professionals don't believe you have dementia and you know that. But 
when I go to see a doctor, um, this creates a lot of uh, confusion for, for the doctor. Uh, as I said, I was diagnosed three years ago, and the doctor that diagnosed me basically diagnosed me on the interview. I saw him for two hours. At the end of the two hours, he said, Sid, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but you have Alzheimer's. I went to my general practitioner and told him, and he says, well, I don't believe that. I don't think you have dementia or Alzheimer's. So I went back to the diagnosing doctor. I looked him in the eye and it said, nobody believes that I have dementia. What do you see that everybody else doesn't? And he said, it, it was how you, how you spoke, how you uh, lived on a daily basis. Uh, and what I thought was kind of strange was, was body language, but I never asked him about that. I asked him, what stage am I at? And he said, well, you know, stages aren't purely defined. He said, well, some of your skills are mild and some of them are moderate. And he said, you should always go out and, and try to retain the, the skills that you have and really work on them and not worry so much about the things that, that you can do. And that's really been uh, very optimal for me. Uh, I also went and, uh, and took cognitive training. Uh, I was medicated. Uh, the medication worked very good. Uh, it sped my thinking and, uh, uh, and kind of pushed away some of the fog. And I was able to, to do a lot of compensation for the, um, uh, the cognitive training, which was three months of intensive training, really helped me with the executive function testing. I, I was tested like six months ago, and the neuropsychologist said, he says, you don't have dementia, you should go back to work. And, and I said, well, that's, that's impossible. And so that was a really long discussion. Um, and the, but, well, I have a new doctor, and he says that I, I don't have dementia. People with dementia know that they have dementia. It's, uh, your abilities are like way up here, I mean, I'm an early onset. I left work at the age of 57. So at the height of my career, the height of my, my earning power. And, and it, the slope was just so dramatic. It, this just doesn't happen to, to a normal person. So it's a double-edged sword. If any of you met me outside or came to, to our booth for Dementia Alliance and talked to me for a while, you, you said, well, Sid doesn't have, he doesn't have the symptoms. He can make sense. He, uh, he can follow conversations. Uh, and I kind of take that as a positive because that's why I've really worked so hard. Because going back to what you know, my wife had said, she didn't want to lose all of our friends and, and family and concern them. So to me, saying, Sid, you don't have dementia, if it's a person here, that's fine. When I go to the doctor and he has to fill out my disability papers, and he says, Sid, you don't have dementia, that is a problem. And it's a problem with a lot of people that have early onset, that are younger, that have early onset dementia. It's because it, it's not viewed as uh, a, a disease that affects people in, in their 40s and 50s. So, thank you very much.